Hi there, folks. In this lesson, I'm going to go ahead and talk about thread-based concurrency in C++. So I want to give you a higher level intuition of what a thread is, and then we'll go ahead and write our first threaded program in C++ here. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. So just to give you an idea of what our mechanism is, what a thread is, a thread is what's known as a lightweight process. So per process, we've always had some main thread, whether you've written single threaded applications or eventually multi-threaded applications, like I'm going to show you, you have a main thread of execution that starts from your main program. And you might be able to execute various functions one after the other. But we're allowed to have a thread, which allows us to also have its own logical control flow, meaning that we're executing different functions and sharing the same code base, but perhaps in a different state. So I'll remove myself here just so you can see that in a separate thread here, say one other thread, a pure thread to our main thread, we have a function here, function two, function three, and so on. So we can execute some other functions or blocks of code here. We're sharing the same code, the same libraries, and potentially some of the same data as well. So we can think of a thread as a lightweight process. For folks who have coordinated multiple processes to sort of achieve parallelism, this is a perhaps familiar concept. But again, there's a slight difference with thread-based concurrency. And here's the idea. And there's a nice diagram here from the book Computer Systems Programmer's Perspective showing that per application that you have, or per process, each thread, and that includes your main thread, if you want to think of just having a single-threaded application or the normal sequential programs that you've been writing, you have it's a unique stack for that thread. And you'll have your own registers, condition codes, a program counter, stack pointer, and so on. And if you create a second thread, well, it has to maintain those separate things as well. And intuitively, this makes sense that there would be its own data registers to keep track of different variables, where you're returning from, and so on. Now, the mechanism for having multiple threads is what's known as context switching. So you can look a little bit at an operating systems course to learn more about the exact mechanism there. But again, you'll notice that we have a separate program counter, separate stack pointer. So each of these separate threads here can have its own place in the program. And on the right side, you'll notice that all the libraries that we've linked in, all of our code, memory that we've allocated on the heap that's globally accessible can be shared by either of these threads. We'll talk about why that's the power of threading and that we can share data, but also one of the weaknesses, because we do have to be a little bit careful with how we write our threaded applications. So let's go ahead and move on and figure out when we, in fact, do want to use threads, because this is just one form of concurrency that we have available to us in C++. So in general, we want to use threads when we have some sort of heavy computation. And again, we would have or benefit, in other words, in performance, by decreasing runtime or increasing throughput, multiple threads of execution working on solving some problem in our program or some series of problems, whether they're related or unrelated. So often you'll see threads on the GPU, for example, used to do embarrassingly parallel tasks. On the CPU, we have threads as well, which is what we're going to focus on in this lesson. But sometimes it also makes sense to thread your program because it simplifies the actual logic of the code. Again, the threading is sort of necessary. You watched the previous lesson in which I've talked about an orchestra where it's just sort of necessary to have ordering within our programs. And threads provide some natural way for you to have different synchronization points or threads solving some part of a sub problem, whether that's making music or doing something in your actual program like reading the same data from a file from multiple sources. So what do we get in modern C++? Well, we get the standard thread library for us. So there are other libraries that we could use or I could teach this in, whether it's Intel's thread building blocks, the boost thread libraries, or just plain P threads if you're used to programming on a Linux system. I would personally recommend following along this series because I'm going to show examples in the standard thread library uh, and some of the capabilities there because you'll have or are more likely to have more portability in the terms of the syntax, how the threads are used, and what's been tested and sort of true on each of those systems. 
But to each their own, just want to let you know those other libraries are available. So let's go ahead and take a look at modern C++'s thread support library. So just give me a moment here to switch here. And CPP Reference, one of my favorite websites here. I'm going to scroll over here. And you'll see to the right the thread support library here. And you'll see again that this is new in C++ 11 and beyond. So we'll be using a compiler that supports C++ 11 or uh, 0x if you're really um, using an older compiler and beyond. So let's go ahead and click on this and see what's available. And you'll see as of now, we have two types of threads here. We'll talk about each of them, but I want to just start with thread itself. So managing a separate thread. And it might be worth reading through this just to understand a few of the different uh, mechanisms and lower level primitives that you may want to use with threads. But never fear, I'm going to show uh, some examples of using threads uh, through this series. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and leave this up here just so you can see what's going on here uh, and some of the different functions here and operations because we'll need some. But let's go ahead and dive into the code. So I've prepared already a, a code here. I'm just going to call this example thread1.cpp here. Okay, so what am I going to need here? Well, let's just do some input and output for our threading example just to demonstrate what's going on here. And I'm going to need to include this thread library. Again, that's what I have uh, here, our standard thread here. And we include the header thread in order to get our functions uh, to us. Okay, and let's just have a main function. And we'll return zero here. And let's just go ahead and create um, some application that prints out a message here. So hello from my main thread. And I'll go ahead and do a standard end line here. And at this point, let me go ahead and um, just expand this uh, window just a little bit so we can see what's going on here. Uh, and this would be a single threaded application, right? I haven't launched any other logical flow. So in order for us to do that and to make this sort of interesting, let's go ahead and create another function here. And we can create it something reasonable like test. I'm going to pass a parameter here because we'll want to talk about passing uh, parameters. And I'm just going to print hello from thread just so that there is uh, some message. We'll have an end line here. And let's go ahead and print out the argument from uh, or argument passed in. And let's go ahead and print out x here and an end line. OK, so this test function is going to be our sort of second flow of execution here that we're going to perform in another thread. You know, it's probably not very interesting, but it's a good example in the sense of just getting you started with the threading library. We'll add on to our examples um, as we go on to make them perhaps a little bit more practical, but I just want to show you how to launch a thread here. So let's go ahead and create a uh, thread object. We're going to call it my thread. And we're going to pass in the address of a function here. And then we have a variable list of arguments that we can pass in. So I'm going to pass in 100 here. Now, what I'm going to do here at this point is go ahead and um, try to compile our program. So let's go ahead and see what happens here. So I'm going to use G++ here. And we want to use at least C++ 11. I'm using 17 these days. And our program, thread1 an output and the uh, program name. So let me go ahead and try this. I'll hit enter. And you'll notice that I do get um, some errors here. So let's go ahead and fix this. So let me get the uh, end line here. And let's try to recompile. So just one compiler error there. And now I'm getting some more errors here. Let me make it a little bit bigger so you can see here. And it's complaining about this standard thread here. And it's saying undefined reference to ethread create. So behind the scenes on my system, since I'm running this on Linux, it needs the pthread library. That means that thread uh, that I have here in C++17, uh, whatever standard library I'm using for C++ is implementing things using pthread. So I need to link in that library. How do I do that? Dash L, pthread, enter, and we're good to go. Let's go ahead and run this program. here. So I'm going to run it here. And we get hello from main thread and then hello from thread here. Um, but then we get this sort of termination here. <laughs> and eventually uh, argument passed in 100 here and abort core dump. So something did go wrong here. And let's go ahead and look at our source code and see if we can try to decipher in this you know already tiny program what happened. 
So we created our thread here, and then we have our main thread. So what could happen here is we don't know what order the threads are actually going to execute it. Because as soon as we create this thread, it's going to execute the test function and run through each of these print statements. And again, you'll see that there was some interleaving between this message, this message, and then finally printing out the argument uh, that was passed. What we have to do in order to make sure that we have some synchronization, because remember that's part of concurrency, that there is some ordering, is to make our main thread wait on the execution of this thread. So our main program, while it's executing, needs to wait until my thread finishes its work. Now this is important because then when we eventually return from our main function, that signals the destruction of our program. So essentially, this error that we're getting, this abort core dump, has occurred because we're starting to destroy our program while this thread is still executing, and that's still part of our program. So how do we fix that? Well, we make our main thread wait until our uh, my thread here has finished. So we'll do my thread dot join. Okay, and let's go ahead and uh, execute this. So I have to recompile, rerun, and this time no uh, core uh, dump here. So hello from thread, argument passed in, and then hello from main thread. And you'll also notice when looking at the source code here that the order is enforced. Again, no matter how many times I run this, this thread will execute, and then our main thread will wait until this thread has finished its execution. So we say it's join with the main thread or the thread from which um, we called our thread from, okay, which is here in main. So go ahead and try to write this program, and congratulations, you've written your first threaded program. If you've taken a moment to do that, let me illustrate with a few slides exactly what's going on, because again, it's not always 100% intuitive. Uh, first, just to uh, clear the door here, uh, we can always look at our documentation and join here. Uh, what is going on is it blocks the current thread until the thread identified by this finishes its execution. So the thread, that is this thread, the one that we're launching, um, is again blocked, or our main thread blocked for making progress or otherwise finishing until my thread uh, finishes. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at this in a visual format just to help you out a little bit here. And here is our example that we wrote in here. And again, for folks who have done fork join parallelism with processes, this will be familiar. Um, so again, we got something like this, not forgetting to link in our library. Depending on your operating system, it's possible that this is a different uh, implementation if you're on Windows, for instance, uh, but this will be for uh, Linux users and you can look that up. So let's go ahead and look at the visual execution uh, of our thread here. So I've got our main thread, again, where we start our program. Uh, and again, by default, we just have one thread uh, in our program at this point. And that's going to start executing all the way down to line 14 here. And then we make our call to my thread. And then our thread's going to start executing here, again, from the test function that I have here. And we can pass in a variable list of arguments here, 100. I have one argument here, so that's the integer here. And as soon as our thread is constructed, it'll immediately uh, start executing from this function. So now we have two threads executing here. And at this point, they are executing concurrently. Now, how they're scheduled on separate cores or the same one is not a problem for us to worry about at this point. We just know that our operating system is going to select one of them, or perhaps um, you know both of them at the same time to execute. Um, it's just sort of arbitrary which thread gets scheduled um, next. But we can control the scheduling, or in other words, the synchronization, and make one of these threads, our main thread, wait or be blocked on the execution of our my thread here, which is executing this test function. So it has to wait there. And again, if you're familiar with fork join parallelism, that is in fact uh, the wait uh, call. And then we do our C out statements. And eventually when we return from our thread, our thread is terminated and some signal is sent back to our main thread that says, yeah, you're unblocked because the work has been finished here from our test function that was executing in my thread. Okay, so we're able to return execution back to our main thread and eventually return and terminate our program. All right, so not too bad. 
And I'll go ahead and leave this up here just for one more second so you can visualize it. And let's go ahead and close things out. So in this lesson, you're able to figure out how to launch your first thread. You can see where it is in CPP reference, the threading support libraries that we're going to be using. And you have this idea of how to, how to launch a thread, join a thread, and you know, perhaps do this multiple times. Let's see if you can actually launch multiple threads and see what happens. We'll talk about it in a future lesson here. So you can uh, see if you can figure out that challenge. So hope you're enjoying the videos and we'll continue on with threading.